Hello, everyone, and welcome to the webcast. My name is Christine Dorsey Davis. I'm the executive director of the Ohio chapter of APA and chair of the New Urbanism Division, and I'm your webcast moderator. Today is Friday, July 6th, and we'll be hearing the presentation, Planning and Zoning Tools for Preserving Historic Communities. For technical help during today's webcast, you can type your questions in the chat box found in the webcast toolbar to the right of your screen, or you can call that 1-800 number shown in bold. And for your content questions related to the presentation, type those again in that box uh, located in the webinar toolbar to the right of your screen. And we will answer those questions at the end of the presentation during the Q&A. Uh, up on your screen now is a list of our sponsoring uh, chapters and divisions for 2018. Thanks to all of those participating members for making these webcasts possible and free to their members. If you're looking down the list and you don't see your chapter division, division listed, we just ask that you reach out to them and ask them to join us. Today in particular, our webcast is sponsored by the South Carolina chapter of APA. And you can learn more about them by visiting their website, scapa.org. Coming up on your screen is a list of our upcoming webcasts for July. Uh, you can register for these and other webcasts by visiting our webcast webpage, ohioplanning.org slash planningwebcast. To log your CM credits for attending today's webcast, just head over to planning.org, log into your My APA account, and then up at the top, you can search for CM activities either by typing in the event number or the title of today's webcast, both of which can be found on our webcast webpage, ohioplanning.org slash planningwebcast. And this webcast has been approved for 1.5 CM credits for live viewing only. We do have some recorded webcasts that are available for distance education. Just head over again to our webcast webpage to learn more about that. Like us on Facebook, Planning Webcast Series, to receive up-to-date information on our sessions. And as always, we are recording today's webcast. It will be available on our YouTube channel. Just head over to YouTube and search Planning Webcast. And at the conclusion of today's session, we will have a PDF available on our webcast webpage. Again, ohioplanning.org slash planningwebcast. Okay, that's it for me. I am going to now turn it over to the Andreas uh, to get today's presentation going. Okay. Perfect. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, yes, you do have two Andreas presenting to you today. Uh, I'm Andrea Petrus. I'm the Deputy Director for the Charleston County, South Carolina um, Planning Department, and I'm also the President of South Carolina um, Chapter of the American Planning Association. And presenting with me today is Andrea Tu, Andrea Harris Long, um, who is a Senior Planner with our department and SCAPA's Secretary Treasurer. So we'll start off today's presentation by discussing the history of settlement communities in Charleston County. Then we'll talk about some of the planning efforts the county has implemented and is currently working on to preserve community culture. And we'll finish up by discussing the historic preservation project the county has recently undertaken to complement our planning efforts. So now I'm going to turn it over to Andrew Harris Long, who will give us a brief history of settlement communities in Charleston County. And hi, everyone. Uh, this is also Andrea. So. Um, to give you all a little bit of background knowledge about what we're going to be discussing, so you'll see here on the map, Charleston County sits in the heart of the Gullah Geechee Cultural Heritage Corridor, which is a national heritage area designated in 2006 by Congress. The corridor stretches along the eastern coast from southern North Carolina to northern Florida, and this area represents a significant story of local, regional, national, and even global importance, recognizing the Gullah Geechee people for maintaining their cultural traditions for centuries. The intent of the designation is really to preserve and interpret the traditional cultural practices, sites, and resources along the Gullah Geechee people. 
And there's a Heritage Commission along with the corridor's executive director who carries out the goals of the corridor designation, which are to recognize, sustain, and celebrate the important contributions made to American cultural and history by the Gullah Geechee people, to assist state and local governments and public and private entities in South Carolina, Georgia, North Carolina, and Florida in interpreting the story of the Gullah Geechee, and also to preserve the Gullah Geechee folklore, arts, crafts, music, and to assist in identifying and preserving sites, historical data, artifacts, and objects associated with Gullah Geechee people and the culture for the benefit and education of the public. And just to note, similar to like national register designations and other federal designations, this is an honorary designation, and really there aren't any protections afforded to these communities in the corridor um, unless they're enacted by local authorities. And so who are the Gullah Geechee? If you're not from the Southeast or live here, you may not be as familiar with this group of folks. Um, so the Gullah Geechee are descendants of the African slaves brought to North America in the 1700s and 1800s. They descend from a diverse group of African countries and cultures. And over time, the different languages and cultures mesh to form a distinctive Gullah Geechee language. And many of the African traditions, such as fishing practices and basket weavings, have been passed on from generation to generation. And if you come to Charleston and walk downtown, you'll see sweet grass basket stands and sweet grass basket weaving. So it's still a very much an integral part of the, the culture here. Um, and we're very proud of this part of our history. We have a lot of local arts and music festivals and venues that feature Gullah singers and storytellers. And we have annual uh, festivals like the Sweetgrass Cultural Arts Festival and Gullah Geechee Cultural Festivals that occur every year. And so who are the, what are the settlement communities? Um, following emancipation in Charleston County, the Gullah Geechee African Americans were finally able to purchase their own lands. And many of these groups settled near former plantations, often near waterways and agricultural lands. And so you'll see on this map um, that Charleston County has a band of settlement communities stretching from the northern end of the county near the south, near the Santee River, down towards the Edisto River in the south. And during the late 19th century and early 20th century, segregation and Jim Crow laws restricted these communities from using certain community facilities. And so as a result, these communities grew into self-sufficient um, towns, little towns comprised of their own commercial services, such as their own restaurants and stores and civic services, parks, schools, um, cemeteries, and community centers. And nearly all of the settlement communities had social lodges that provided financial assistance, food, and other community services. And these lodges are still often found today, and some of them listed on the National Register of Historic Places. And so up until 2015, Charleston County had not done a lot in the way of historic preservation. And um, our last historic resources survey had been done in 1992, so it was fairly outdated. And we knew that there were a lot of historic resources in the county that had not been recognized yet and were at a risk of being destroyed as the county developed. And so in 2015, Charleston County hired New South Associates to update the historic resources survey, focusing on just the unincorporated parts of the county. And the most significant finding from this survey was the formal recognition of the African-American settlement communities. And the consultants that we hired, New South Associates, they did an amazing job of researching these communities and really finding out more about how they had settled over time, highlighting the different development patterns and, and the architectural um, styles. And so in looking more closely at the different types of settlement communities, it became evident that there were three main types in Charleston County. And we're going to talk about those. There's the remnant freedmen communities, land commission plotted communities, and planned land cooperative communities. And so the first that is the majority of the settlement communities in Charleston County are remnants of former slave villages or early freedmen settlements. And these were often located on former plantations where African-American fami families accumulated parcels of land over time. And so you can see here, um, pictured on the left, this is the Sulagree community on James Island, which we'll talk a little bit about more later. But oftentimes these communities had long, thin, steep lots that maximized frontage on both the local roads and the waterways. The parcels were often inconsistently sized, ranging from one to 40 acres. And over time, the parcels have been subdivided so you have atypical subdivision um, patterns. Uh, a lot of these parcels have become landlocked and are often adjacent to the waterways. The land uses were typically clustered close to the road with deep rear setbacks. Um, fences were often rare in these communities. And a lot of times there were a lot of agricultural uses um, that have started in the past and have continued on into the future. 
So the second type of community is the um, land commission platted communities. And these were communities that following emancipation, the South Carolina Land Commission, which was established in 1868, they um, were tasked with purchasing former plantation tracts from owners and sur surveying and subdividing these properties and selling it to landless black and white farmers and tradesmen. And so these have a little bit more of a formalized plat pattern, as you can see here on the slide, the top right, the top right photo is um, a plat of the Phillips community from the 1800s, and then you can see the parcel boundaries as they are today on the bottom right. Um, the development pattern here, there tend to be rectilinear lots ranging from 7 to 25 acres in size, and the lots are still usually oriented to the road, and over time, the lots have been subdivided for family members, and again, fences are rarely used, just a very open um, community with the families gathering their houses nearby one another. And so two examples of these communities in Charleston County is the Phillips community and the Snowden communities in Mount Pleasant. And so the last type of um, settlement community that was identified in our historic resources survey were the pl planned land cooperative communities. And these communities were started by a members-based land cooperatives that were often funded by development companies. And so here in the Charleston area, the Charleston Land Company was a cooperative that purchased the land for the Scanlonville community in Mount Pleasant. And this is more of a traditional neighborhood style. You can see on the plat on the, on the slide that there were often gridded street plans that had more consistent lot sizes. Um, the neighborhoods usually had agricultural area designated and there was usually just one resident per lot and um, they were more publicly defined community spaces. And the company that would fund the cooperative would also usually assume responsibilities operating like a modern day homeowners association in some ways, and would preside over farming issues within the community. They would sometimes you know, help settle disputes between shareholders or subscribers. They would help create mutual benefit funds for some of the community members, and they would also manage the public spaces and community areas like the cemeteries or um, parks. And so as part of the um, historic resources survey update, it was determined that four of the African American settlement communities were designated as eligible for the National Register of Historic Places under Criterion A, which highlights the community planning um, and the development for retaining various settlement patterns established decades following emancipation and the Black ethnic heritage for the Gullah Geechee heritage. And the resources survey update did note that 16 other communities, they could possibly be eligible for the National Register with further research. And so one of the things that we'll talk about a little bit later that's often common in the settlement area, um, settlement communities, is heirs' property. This is something that um, is common, I think, throughout the South. But uh, what is heirs' property for those that you may not be familiar with it? Um, heirs' property results from property being transferred from generation to generation without the presence of a will or a state plan. And as a family member passes away without the will, um, the land is left to the living heirs. And as generations pass away, the list of heirs will um, with a stake in the land increases. And so in some cases, hundreds of heirs may own, have ownership of one parcel of land. And so why is heirs property sometimes an issue? Um, heirs may not agree with how to deal with the property. There might be forced partitions that are necessary, and that could sometimes happen through the court system. And also lands may be lost due to tax default if heirs do not pay the property taxes if there's a disagreement among, among the heirs. And heirs property has land development implications. If there's lack of clear title and ownership, then that can prevent heirs from subdividing land, rezoning property, or developing and complying with all of the applicable regulations. But heirs property is also an important part of the history of settlement communities and it should be preserved. Heirs property is tied to the traditions of Gullah Geechee culture with land ownership being very meaningful and symbolic. And many settlement communities have remained intact because of heirs property and the tradition of family owned land. And local organizations such as the Center for Heirs Property Preservation here in Charleston helps families keep their land and resolve heirs property issues. Um, historically, the many settlement areas, settlement communities have worked closely with Charleston County over the years and have had a strong voice whenever projects and requests are going through the legislative process. 
um, Charleston County is rapidly growing and many of the settlement communities in the specifically the county's urban and suburban area have felt development pressures due to large amounts of vacant land available in these communities. And as a result, the communities have recently banded together to create the African American Settlement Communities Historic Commission. And they've been working closely with the town of Mount Pleasant and us at the Charleston County Planning Department and other departments to ensure the settlement communities are recognized and preserved in the years to come. And so now I'm going to turn it over to Andrea, who's going to talk about some of our planning efforts here to preserve the settlement community. All right. So like Andrea said, we are now going to talk about the planning tools the county has implemented to preserve the culture of these historic communities. First, we'll talk about the adoption of the county's first comprehensive plan back in 1999 and the subsequent zoning and land development regulations ordinance that implemented the policies of the plan. And those policies did include settlement area provisions to help protect and preserve our historic communities. And then we'll discuss how the county worked with the residents of our historic communities to strengthen preservation and planning efforts through subsequent reviews and updates of the comprehensive plan and community planning projects. In 1994, South Carolina state law changed to require jurisdictions that had zoning and or land development regulations to adopt a comprehensive plan. Uh, Charleston County had never had a comprehensive plan, um, and so this was sort of our, our first, um, first time doing one. And we adopted our first plan on April 20th, 1999, after a two-year-long planning process. Prior to the adoption of the plan, there were no density restrictions in the county other than a 30,000 square foot minimum lot size to allow room for septic tanks and wells since the majority of the unincorporated area was and still is not served by public water or sewer. The previous zoning also included some land use restrictions based on zoning districts. Now the adoption of the comprehensive plan in 1999 repealed all of that previous zoning and instituted a suburban rural area edge which eventually became an urban growth boundary as a growth management tool. And then the map on the right, you can see the dotted black line is that edge. Everything on the east and west side of it is in the rural area where infrastructure really doesn't exist to serve um, development. And so that's very low density and everything on the inside of it down into the Charleston Peninsula, that's the urban suburban area where the, those infrastructure and services exist. And that's where we wanted to see growth occur. Um, as part of the plan, um, it, it included new density restrictions by future land use designation, which we had never had before. And it drastically reduced the densities allowed in the rural area to as low as one unit per acre, one unit per eight acres, one unit per 10 acres, one unit per 15 acres, and in some cases, one unit per 25 acres. But it did allow increased densities in the urban and suburban area to drive the growth into that area. So as you can imagine, these lower densities in the rural area were not particularly popular with many of the property owners there. Um, and so it took about another year and a half for the county to adopt the new Zoning and Land Development Regulations Ordinance, um, otherwise known as the LDR, that contained the regulations to implement the new policies of the comprehensive plan. And the ZLDR was finally adopted on November 20th of 2001. So this is the future land use map that was adopted as part of the 1999 comprehensive plan. So again, you can see the um, suburban rural area edge in that, the black dotted line. The pink areas on the eastern and western uh, ends of the county, uh, that's the resource management future land use category. That carries our lowest density, the maximum density of one unit for 25 acres. On the eastern end of the county, this is mostly the Francis Marion National Forest. Um, and the lands on the western side of the county are um, generally timber operations owned by companies um, like Midwest Baco. The settlement areas were defined as part of the 1999 comprehensive plan, and these areas were only located in the rural areas of the county. They're shown in dark purple on this map. You can see some here on Edisto Island, some in western Charleston County on Wadmala Island, and then out in the East Cooper area of the county near McClellanville and Allendale. Um, they're really small, older crossroads communities, family lands, waterfront lands, and vacant land that have been subdivided into lots for residential use. 
They were recommended for the agricultural residential future land use designation in the plan, and that designation was intended for agricultural and single family residential uses and had a density range of one unit per five acres on the low end to one unit per acre on the high end. And the one unit per acre designation is, was the highest density that was allowed in the rural area, and that was intentional to allow for further subdivision of these properties. And many of the county's historic communities <clears throat> in the rural area were designated as settlement areas through this process. When the Zoning and Land Development Regulations Ordinance was finally adopted in 2001, those settlement area properties were zoned in the Agricultural Residential District. And that district allowed agricultural and single family residential land uses at the maximum uh, end of that density range from the comprehensive plan. So they were allowed a one unit per acre maximum density. And as I mentioned, many of the county's rural historic communities, um, which included Germantown, Parker's Ferry, Adams Run, Osborne, and Jericho, were placed in the settlement areas and were subsequently zoned agricultural residential. This had some unintended side effects. Um, including that this new zoning district, agricultural residential, ended up zoning out the small neighborhood businesses that historically existed in the communities. Many of those businesses have shut their doors over the years and can no longer be reopened because of the zoning regulations. As you can imagine, many of these communities are located very far from gas stations, grocery stores, doctor's offices, and other services, and have to drive long distances to access these services since the zoning would no longer let them um, be located nearby. The fix for this came with the 2015 five-year review of the comprehensive plan, which I'll discuss in just a couple of minutes. Before we get to that, though, I want to talk about a similar unintended consequence that was created by the 1999 comprehensive plan and 2001 zoning and land development regulations ordinance for properties that were located in the urban and suburban area. The 1999 plan created a future land use category for the urban and suburban area that was called residential special management. The future land use designation was defined as including established communities interspersed with large tracts of land and communities with lifestyles that were more rural than suburban and which had mixed density residential patterns. Commercial institutional office development was recommended to be allowed in these communities to offer services to the residents. And some rural uses that would not typically be found in the suburban area, such as farming, were recommended. These properties are shown in dark green on these two future land use maps. And the one on the top left, this is James Island. These are unincorporated areas. And you saw before Andrew was talking about Saul Agree. That was one of them. That's right here. And to the north of that, this is the Grimble Farm community. And on the bottom map on the bottom right, this is the East Cooper area. And we've got a bunch of communities that are in the Rifle Range corridor. We've got Whitehall and Copahe. We've got the Phillips community, which Andrea talked about, and the Snowden community, which Andrea also talked about. These were recommended for a density of one unit per acre up to three units per acre. Uh, the 2001 Zoning and Land Development Regulations Ordinance implemented that residential special management future land use designation through the R1 Rural Residential Zoning District, which allowed a density of up to 2.75 dwelling units per acre and limited land uses to single family residential and some rural uses, crop production, chickens, and so forth. It did not, however, allow any uses that would offer services to residents, which was out of character with the definition of the future land use designation. So, as was the case with the settlement area designation, the residential special manager designation, again, zoned out the small neighborhood businesses that had historically existed in these communities. And in addition, portions of these communities were being developed in ways that eroded their culture. We saw a lot of development in these communities because they were in the urban and suburban area. Um, and portions of them were being annexed by other jurisdictions that resulted in inconsistent zoning and land use regulations. So now let's talk about what the county did to address these issues for our historic communities in both the rural area and the urban and suburban areas. Sweetgrass Basket Stand Special Consideration Area was one of the first ways we addressed the zoning issues in our communities, and this was in the 2006-2007 timeframe. The residents of the historic communities located in the area shown on this map between Highway 17 North, Porsche A's Bluff Road, um, Rifle Range Road at the south, and then the Isle of Palms connector <clears throat> approached the county about the issues created by new development in the area. Part of the area is incorporated in the town of Mount Pleasant, 
in part is, unincorpor is unincorporated. Um, the town areas are shown in gray in this map, and all the other colors indicate areas that are um, unincorporated. The residents were concerned that new development was not in character with historic land development patterns, and they were also concerned with the development of high intensity commercial uses along Highway 17 North in this area. To address these concerns, the county and the town of Mount Pleasant got together and worked with the Coastal Communities Foundation, which is a nonprofit organization here in Charleston, to engage the residents and identify their vision of the future for the area. The project, which included a year of community meetings, resulted in the Sweetgrass Basket Sand Special Consideration Area, which is essentially an overlay district that was adopted in 2007. The overlay district created land use design and development requirements based on what we heard from the residents. Both the town and county adopted identical standards that addressed the concerns of the residents, created consistency, and discouraged jurisdiction shopping. The map that you see here shows, again, the overlay district area. And again, the areas in gray are in the town of Mount Pleasant, and the areas in green, blue, and orange are unincorporated. The overlay district reinforced the importance of sweetgrass basket sands by encouraging them along the Highway 17 North corridor. It allowed limited commercial uses along the frontage of Highway 17 North, which is shown in this orange sort of hatch mark color. Um, but combined them to within 500 feet of the right-of-way line and instituted maximum building size limitations and design standards to ensure they fit in with the character of the community. Uh, the overlay district also limited the old Georgetown Loop office area, which is shown here in blue, to office and residential uses and instituted new design and development standards to protect the residential community to the south of Old Georgetown Road. And it restricted all other development to single family detached residential development, which is the, the green areas. Um, have lot sizes consistent with those of the existing historic communities, which are typically on the order of 14,500 square feet plus. In addition, the overlay allows accessory dwelling units to be located on lots um, that don't necessarily comply with the county's requirements for accessory dwelling units. The county requires one and a half times the minimum lot size. And in these areas, in the overlay districts, the regulations were written to allow um, just the minimum lot size um, to be required for accessory dwelling unit development. These changes have seemed to work well over the years, although there have been some tweaks to the regulations over time that were made in coordination with the town and residents. Just recently, we've heard from residents of the old Georgetown office loop area who want to revisit the overlay to allow more retail uses, not just the office uses in this particular area. So we'll be working with the residents in the town on this over the next year or so. The next action the county took was to add a new Rural Cultural Community Protection Future Land Use category and rename and redefine the Residential Special Management designation as part of the five-year review of the comprehensive plan that was adopted in 2015. The new Cultural Community Protection Future Land Use designation was intended as an alternative to the settlement areas designation for historic communities in the rural area, but it did not replace it. It included a maximum density of up to one unit per acre to allow for increased subdivision for properties currently in lower density categories, but stated that the subdivision and development should protect and promote the culture and unique development patterns of existing communities and sustain their strong sense of community. The plan recommends that future development in these areas should be compatible with the existing community and that residences, agriculture, forestry, churches, cemeteries, cultural and historic buildings, schools, post offices, and so forth should be allowed. In addition, it recommends that compatible businesses and offices should be allowed to offer services and employment opportunities for local residents, provided the building scale and coverage fits with existing structures. It also states that the zoning and land development regulations in these areas should be customized to meet the needs of the individual communities. Only one community, the Parkers Ferry community in Western Charleston County, was assigned this particular designation in the plan in 2015. And that was because staff had been in the process of working with that community to develop a community plan and overlay zoning district since 2013. And these particular changes to the future land use designation were all part of that process. The idea was that other communities that fit the description of the designation could request a comprehensive plan amendment to be assigned this future land use category in the future if they so desired, and the request would be up to county council to say yes or no to on a case-by-case -case basis. This was intentional in order to balance the need to create more customized zoning for our historic communities with protecting against 
allowing a density of one dwelling unit per acre all, all over the rural area of the county, which is not what we wanted to do. To date, no other communities have requested this future land use designation. The 2015 Comprehensive Plan Review also replaced the Residential Special Management Future Land Use designation with the Urban and Suburban Cultural Community Protection Future Land Use designation. The definition of this new designation was similar to that of the Rural Cultural Community Protection designation we just discussed, but it was intended for the historic communities in the urban and suburban area. It increased their maximum density recommendations from three units to acre per acre to four units per acre, and it placed emphasis on creating customized zoning to meet the needs of the individual communities. This is our future land use map that was adopted as part of the 2015 Comprehensive Plan Review. It shows the Rural Cultural Community Protection Future Land Use Designation for the Parkers Ferry Community in Western Charleston County, which is this sort of light brown color. Um, where my cursor is, and it shows the urban suburban cultural community protection designation for the historic communities in the urban and suburban area. You can see those, White Hall, Copahee, Phillips, um, Bowden, Rifle Range Road Corridor, and then over Salt Agree, um, Grimble Farm, Red Top in West Ashley, and then Costa Road up in the north area. Yeah. Now let's talk about how these future land use designations have been implemented through the Parker's Ferry Community Plan for the rural area and the Stahl Agree Community Plan for the urban and suburban area. I'm going to talk about the Parker's Ferry Plan and Andrea Harris Long will discuss the Stahl Agree Plan. This map shows the Parker's Ferry area in the county. Um, it's located in an unincorporated area of the Western Charleston County near the intersection of Parker's Ferry Road and Savannah Highway, which is also Highway 17 South just west of the towns of Hollywood, Ravenel, and Megan, which are also fairly small rural towns. It's in the rural, the area, rural area of the county and is made up of several smaller settlement communities, including Jericho, Osborne, Parker's Ferry, and Adams Run that all identify as the Parker's Ferry community. It's surrounded by large tracts of land, some of which are vacant or in conservation easements, and several of which are in agricultural and or timber production. So map on the bottom left here shows the general location of the Parker's Ferry area in, in the county. Um, and the map on the right shows the 1,600 or so properties in that brownish color um, that are included in the Parker's Ferry community. Um, and this, this boundary was drawn by the residents um, that attended these meetings. The project began in 2012 when representatives of the community approached the county regarding issues the zoning in the area were creating including the inability to subdivide property due to densities of one unit per eight acres or lower, the lack of employment opportunities, the lack of businesses and services in close proximity, and the need for infrastructure improvements. Starting in 2013, staff worked with the community members to define the study area boundary that you just saw, the community name, and complete a community needs survey. The results of the survey and the community input were used to identify specific community needs and the potential solutions. Current with these meetings was the five-year review of the Charleston County Comprehensive Plan in 2015, where that new Rural Cultural Community Protection Future Land Use designation that we discussed earlier was adopted. Um, and that was tailored to the community needs, and it opened the door for us to do this community plan and an overlay zoning district that especially uh, that address the, the community's needs regarding density and subdivision issues. Um, it's important to note here that the success of this project is really due to the community's support and dedication to it. They were absolutely amazing. There were at least 125 people at every meeting that we had. It was always standing room only, and 99.9% .9 of them were on the same page regarding what they wanted for their community. So it really made our job easy. We even received a 100% response rate on the community needs survey. Um, many community members also attended each planning commission and council meeting during the adoption process, even though where we were holding the meetings, the county building was at least 45 minutes from where they lived. It was just that important to them to make sure that their desires, uh, and those of their community were clear and that county council approved what they were asking for. So it really was a, a very rewarding process for us in that respect. As I said, you know, we had amazing response to the community needs survey. 
The main issues that came out of the survey included zoning regulations that had zoned out commercial uses, making the small businesses that had historically been in the community, such as general stores and social clubs, non-conforming. This slide shows some of the businesses that had once operated in the Parker's Ferry community. Also of issue were land development regulations that impeded the subdivision of lands, um, especially for family members. And as Andrea mentioned, heirs' property issues um, were, big, were big in this. Um, and again, those include the potential for families to lose their land at the annual tax sale if the heirs fail to coordinate on paying annual tax bills. And also an issue that land without clear title cannot be subdivided. So a community plan that describes the community needs and includes strategies to address those needs resulted from this effort. The community plan addressed not only planning and zoning issues, but also employment and economic development, public works and transportation issues, and public service needs. The idea was that our planning staff would work with the community to implement the planning and zoning related strategies of the community plan, and then would put the community representatives in contact with the appropriate agencies and organizations to address the other plan strategies that were sort of outside the planning and zoning world. County Council adopted the community plan in 2016, and planning staff immediately began working with the community to address the planning and zoning related strategies through an overlay zoning district customized to meet their needs. The Parker's Ferry Community Overlay Zoning District was developed in concert with the residents of the community and was adopted by County Council in 2017. It addresses primary community needs and issues by preserving the unique cultural heritage of the community, improving the potential for retail and public services, as well as employment opportunities, and increasing the flexibility to subdivide and develop property. It also creates two development districts, the residential areas and the business nodes and commercial properties. I'll show you where those are in just a minute. Next slide. So this slide shows the residential areas. Um, they're in yellow and the commercial properties and business nodes are shown in red. The residential areas of the overlay district uh, allows additional flexibility for these parcels. Um, it allows an expansion in the number of homes, increasing the density up to one unit per acre for all of these properties. It allows flexible lot requirements to enable subdivision, really just basing that minimum lot size on the amount needed for wells and septic tanks because there is no public water or sewer in this area. An increased ability to develop accessory dwelling units and more flexibility for home occupations, as well as allowing additional uses in the residential areas that you might not find in other communities. This is the same map you just saw, but now we're going to concentrate on the business nodes and commercial properties. Um, the business nodes, uh, we identified their location in concert with the community, so they're where the community said they wanted them, and then we did a lot of work on the types of uses that they, the community wanted to see in this area. We came up with these six business nodes. All parcels that were in a commercial zoning district previous to the overlay retain their commercial zoning. Um, commercial properties are those properties that are zoned commercial in the overlay but are not located in a business node. So we have six nodes and then we have sort of a scattering of commercial properties. Um, and those scattering of commercial properties were either properties that were zoned commercially prior to the overlay, we didn't want to take that away from them, um, or they were ones that were zoned commercially as part of this process. Now, and there also was an allowance for accessory dwelling units with the same restrictions as residential um, areas for accessory dwellings. The Parker's Ferry Community Plan Project achieved the goal of improving zoning and land development regulations to meet the needs of the community. But more importantly than that, it gave the community a sense of, of ownership and empowerment. Many residents have since become very active in pursuing the other implementation strategies of the plan, and they've also begun attending council meetings to request improvements and services for their community and to monitor and comment on the decisions being made and their impact on their community, which we didn't see that from these folks before. So that was, that was great. So now I will turn it back over to Andrew Harris-Long, who's going to talk about the Soul Agree planning project. So um, we mentioned Solagri a little bit earlier, but the Solagri community is shown here on the map. It's located on James Island, which is a little bit west, southwest of Charleston. And um, it's right before you reach Folly Beach if you're driving 
and you're familiar with the Charleston area at all. It's in the urban suburban area of the county. And, you know, this community was first settled post reconstruction near the former Grimble plantation, and it was subdivided then into long lot farms with access to both the waterways and on the north and south sides of the community and the main road that accesses the community, which is Bullagree Road, which um, my cursor is following here. It's the main road into the community. And Bullagree was designated as eligible for the National Register as part of our 2016 Historic Resources Survey update. Bullagree thrived throughout the 20th century as a small community, having many small businesses, such as Backman Seafood, which is pictured here. Um, a commercial fishing operation with a shrimp dock at the end. There were several general stores and ice cream snack shops. There's Mosquito Beach, which was a tourist area for African Americans in the mid mid 19th century or 20th century. Um, and it was one of the few beaches actually available in the area in the midst of segregation. Um, so it's a historical landmark in its own regard. With the adoption of the new zoning ordinance in 2001, as Andrea mentioned, the majority of the commercial zoning in this area was changed to residential zoning, resulting in legal non-conforming uses. And the subdivision standards that were adopted at that time did not consider the unusually long, skinny lots in full agree. Other community issues similar to Parker's Ferry was Parker's Ferry was that there were heirs property. And on James Island, a threat of gentrification due to rising land costs and the development of vacant parcels. James Island is one of the pricier areas in the county uh, being close to the water and the beach. And so residents were worried that property taxes would go up and the values would um, price them out of their community. And so as a result of community issues and concerns, uh, county councils directed staff to work with the community to create a community plan and an overlay zoning district. And the project was really successful in large part because of the concerned citizens of Soul Agree Group who helped facilitate community surveys stakeholder meetings and community workshops. And much like the Parker's Ferry Project, we had an overwhelming amount of support from the residents, participation from the residents. We met at the community center here and every, every meeting was full. We were often in standing room only and had well over a hundred people. And this community is really not that big. They're only about 300 parcels. So it's a much smaller community, but we had great participation. And so once the community plan was created, we worked with citizens to create overlay zoning district regulations, which really was the heart of how we were addressing the most pressing issues that had been brought to our attention. The lack of neighborhood commercial uses that were historically present and the traditional subdivision standards. And so the overlay zoning district helped to and also ensure that we could preserve and promote the unique development patterns that had been identified in the 2016 survey update. After several months of working with the community to draft the overlay reg regulations, we had a, an overlay zoning district that established fle flexible subdivision standards for the long, narrow lots. And we did this by decreasing the setbacks and adding minimum lot size and decreasing the minimum lot sizes and adding maximum building sizes to keep housing and scale with the neighborhood character and lot sizes. The overlay also allowed for the redevelopment of properties that had historically been commercial. We worked meticulously with the residents to refine the list of allowable uses and include development standards to ensure that redevelopment was consistent with the community character. And we also relaxed the standards for home occupations and accessory dwelling units. We knew that many of the residents already had home businesses and that they'd like to continue to do that or have the opportunity to do them in the future. And we also knew that there was an interest in having accessory dwelling units for family members. And historically, multiple homes had been on the had been built on lots. So we increased the maximum building size for accessory dwelling units, removed the minimum lot size for accessory dwelling units, and also allowed separate electrical meters. And so this, um, like the Parker's Ferry overlay, has two different areas, the residential area and the commercial area. And in the residential area, since this is mostly a residential community, this was the most impactful for the majority of the residents. This table really compares what the current zoning was and then what the overlay zoning um, allowed for residents. So looking at the table on the left, the options there, that's what the zoning was prior to the overlay being adopted. It was in the special management three zoning district that Andrea had talked about. And this is still an option for residents. If you're um, an owner in this community and you don't have one of those long narrow lots that makes it hard to develop, then you can still develop under the previous zoning regulations. However, if you are in a situation where you have a long narrow lot that wouldn't conform to the current zoning standards, 
then the column on the right really allows for more development options. And so if you do the overlay development option, um, there is a requirement that the, the lot that you have is less than 110 feet in width. And we added a lot of flexibility here, decreasing the minimum lot area to 10,000 square feet, decreasing the minimum lot width to 50 feet. We decreased the setbacks and then also the maximum building size was added. And this was something that we heard from residents. They wanted to ensure that, you know, the size of homes didn't stick out like a sore thumb compared to what was already in the in the community. And they also wanted to make sure that it was in scale with the smaller lot sizes. So if you use the overlay development option, then the maximum building size is 2,500 square feet. And so we knew that if we um, were going to work with the residents to allow commercial uses to come back into the community, we wanted to make sure that they were what the residents wanted. And so we worked very closely with the community at several different meetings to identify where and what types of commercial uses they wanted. And in the end, they really just wanted to see the parcels where small businesses had formerly been to have the opportunity to redevelop. And this ended up being in three main areas of the community. There's the Mosquito Beach area which has traditionally been a tourist and recreation area in the past with several different restaurants and a small hotel. And so today, one to two restaurants still exist and special events take place in the area. Um, in the middle of the community, there were two old um, snack and convenience stores that had closed several years ago and the community wanted these to possibly redevelop into neighborhood commercial uses. And so those were identified as commercial and you can see those here. The buildings obviously need a lot of work, but there's some good potential there for a, a neighborhood um, snack shop or convenience store. And then the last area is where Backman Seafood and the Seashore Lodge is. And, um, and this is at the intersection of Soligree and Old Soligree Road. And the community really thought that this could be sort of the, the downtown of Soligree. We heard that at one of the meetings. And so this was identified as a commercial node and the Seashore Lodge actually has been listed on the National Register and restored by the community and serves as a community landmark. So this was a good um, commercial potential for the community. And so both the Soligree and Parker's Ferry projects, they serve as examples of where we were able to get excellent community engagement, apply planning principles and cultural preservation to come out with great projects that preserve communities that are critical to our community. I mean, the history of Charleston County, the settlement areas um, are critical to that. So these um, have really served as examples for not just the county, but I think other jurisdictions. Um, we've been working closely with the town of Mount Pleasant as they are working on their comprehensive plan update to possibly do an interjurisdictional project similar to this with the settlement communities in their jurisdiction. And the county was also recognized by the local preservation organization, Historic Charleston Foundation, for our survey update project on the Parker's Ferry and Soligree community projects. And so these unique preservation projects have really drawn attention to a different history in Charleston that should be recognized more. And lastly, we are in the middle of our 10 year update of the comprehensive plan, and we have been working to update our cultural resources element to include the findings of our 2016 survey update and coordinate with the town of Mount Pleasant and the African American Settlement Communities Historic Commission. And we are adding a new strategy to support the continuing of our community planning work done in Parker, Surrey, and Soligree, and we hope to expand it to the other settlement communities throughout the county. And so Andrea is going to talk a little bit about some of our other historic preservation planning projects. Okay, so in closing, we want to mention two additional ongoing projects that are intended to help preserve our historic community. Amendments to the county's historic preservation ordinance and the National Park Service Civil Rights Grant we recently received to do an oral history project with former students of one of the equalization schools located on James Island. So the county is currently considering amendments to its existing historic preservation regulations to clarify and improve them. Um, they're currently very short. Uh, they are somewhat unclear on what they are intended to protect. So we've been working with a consultant and a committee of our planning commission for several years now to improve upon them. The proposed regulations that are currently in the adoption process set up a historic preservation commission 
establish a process for county council to create a list of locally significant historic properties and districts. This is a voluntary process and will require property owners to sign the, the application to go through this process. We call this the designation of historic property process. And it creates a process by which proposed changes to county designated and national register listed historic properties and districts can be reviewed and determined by the Historic Preservation Commission. And this is called a certificate of historic appropriateness process. As Andrea mentioned when she was talking, uh, representatives of our historic communities have been very supportive of these ordinance amendments. They see it as a way to protect their communities. If they can get their communities designated as historic through this process, they'll be more able to protect them from development or redevelopment that is out of character with their historical, cultural, and architectural characters. And as I mentioned, these amendments are still in the adoption process. They are on the July 24th County Council agenda for second reading and in South Carolina counties are required to have three readings. So hopefully they will be in place in August or September. Charleston County government was recently awarded an African American civil rights grant to conduct an oral history project. The project is wholly funded by the US Department of the Interior and the National Park Service. We are in the process of putting out a request for proposals for consulting services for this project. And the purpose of the project is to interview alumni from W. Gresham Maggott Elementary and High School, which taught grades 1 through 12 for African American students. The school was constructed as part of the South Carolina Equalization Program, which was enacted by lawmakers in 1951. The state program allocated public funding for construction of new schools and renovations of existing schools with the intent of dedicating most funding to African American schools. This program was a reaction to the impending desegregation of schools, which was federally mandated in 1954 with the U.S. Supreme Court decision, Brown v. Board of Education. Preservation efforts for the W. Gresham Maggott School began recently. A local nonprofit organization, the Heritage Community Development Corporation, has been formed to preserve the school and create an exhibit on the South Carolina Equalization Program, and specifically life as a student attending W. Gresham Maggott in the midst of the civil rights movement. The school itself was recently listed on the National Register of Historic Places. The oral history project will involve working closely with the Heritage Community Development Corporation and other community stakeholders. We've already had a few meetings with them about this. The oral histories will provide insight on the lives of African American students in the midst of desegregation. The stories and experiences paired with academic research on the civil rights movement will allow historians to better understand the cultural impacts of segregation and desegregation. The grant products will be used by the county and local public institutions and nonprofits, such as the Charleston County Public Library, the School District, the College of Charleston, the Avery Research Institute, and so forth, for preservation planning, heritage tourism, development, and education. If you're looking for more information on the topics that we discussed today, you can visit any of the websites that are listed here. And that concludes our presentation. We really appreciate your attention. Please feel free to call or email Andrea or I with any questions that don't get answered during the Q&A session today. Or if you have any opportunities to collaborate, uh, our contact information is shown here on the slide. So now we're happy to open up the Q&A session. Great, thank you. Okay, let's get started because we have quite a few questions here to get through. First one. How are local governments encouraged to implement recommendations of the historical corridor? We work with the local governments to try to create consistent design standards and other, other planning standards. Um, right now, I guess the, the next step we have is with the town of Mount Pleasant will be the next one that we work with and they're working through their comprehensive plan update. In South Carolina, we're all on the same sort of schedule for our comprehensive plans. Since state law changed and we were all required to adopt one by the end of 99, and we're all required to have five-year reviews and 10 years updates, which is good because we all sort of do it at the same time. So, so we'll be working with, with the town on that. Okay. Next question, what is the difference between rural residential and agricultural residential? Is it due to different densities? What is it? Um, yeah, so the rural residential has a slightly different density than the agricultural residential. Um, the rural residential is intended to be sort of a buffer outside of our urban growth boundary. 
and has a density of three or one one unit per three acres, whereas agricultural residential is one unit per acre. And the agricultural residential correlated with the settlement area study that Andrea mentioned that we did in 2001. Yeah. And then there was another rural residential at the time. It was RR1, um, and that was for the urban and suburban area. They had higher densities of up to three units per acre and slightly less rural uses. Okay, great, thank you. Um, and when you were talking about septic, is the four units per acre permitted on septics? Um, is that a problem? Yeah, that's a problem. That that wouldn't happen. Um, you know, that's a maximum density, so you would need to get sewer in order to to make that happen. Okay. Um, next question: Does the comprehensive plan provide any recommendations which directly address? an inevitable severe hurricane and or a sea rise due to climate change. Yep, so we actually are in the process of doing a resiliency element of the comprehensive plan. Um, one of the strategies that has come out of our current tenure update is to address resiliency more in the comprehensive plan. It hasn't really um, talked about it too much to this point. So we're wrapping up our tenure update right now. And once that's adopted this fall, then we have a subcommittee formed of planning commission to work on resiliency and have it be more present through the comprehensive plan. Thank you. Um, why do you think the earlier comprehensive plans fell so short in terms of accommodating the unique needs of the special communities? Um, were there any targeted outreach to these communities, or is that something that is only happening more recently? I think it was the struggle to understand what a comprehensive plan was, because it was the first time the county had been required to do one. So they were doing their best. I mean, that, that plan is about 500 pages long, and it has strategies for not only the county, but all kinds of other organizations. So I think that maybe this wasn't real clear on, on what they were supposed to be doing and, and what the plan was supposed to, to have in it. They had a consultant at the time. Um, I think it was just sort of overwhelming. And maybe that got lost in kind of the shuffle, unfortunately. Um, and it was just sort of an unintended consequence of the, actually the comprehensive plan did mention that, that those uh, particular areas should have some service uses to allow, you know, to, for the residents. Um, it just didn't get translated into the new zoning ordinance. So I think I think it was just an issue of it just kind of, no one realized it was happening. It was completely unintended. They knew they were trying to give them the, the one unit per acre, the higher density, but the issue of the services um, became a problem. And so now, yeah, we are trying much harder to go back in. Um, the county has, you know, have a, we've got a renewed focus on historic preservation like Andrew was talking about with our survey update and these new projects and the historic preservation um, ordinance we've got going through the adoption process now. Okay, thank you. You had indicated that um, there were community meetings held at a county facility, which was about a 45 minute drive away from the community. Um, was that an issue? Did with, were there considerations of trying to host it closer to the residents? Why or we're not? So all of the community meetings, whenever we were going through the process of creating the community plan, creating the overlay, those were held in the community. So for Parker's Ferry, we went out to the Willtown Community Center, which is right in the heart of where everyone lives there. In Sulagree, we met at the Sulagree Community Center, which is right in the middle of the community. The meetings that were held at our building were once it was going through the adoption process. So our planning commission and county council meetings were held here. Um, and so that's what Andrea was speaking about was we were so thrilled that the community made the 45 minute drive into town to attend those adoption process meetings. So all of the community meetings leading up to that were held in the community. Okay, great, thanks. Um, the sole agree, which by the way, I don't understand how it's spelled one way and pronounced a completely different way. <laughs> like I just, I don't even understand. It's spelled L-E-G-A-R-E -E and you just say it Legree and there's, I don't know, whatever. <laughs> anyway, so what's the origin of this name we want to know? Did the name predate the Civil War? Was it 
named by the people who inhabited it during, you know, the reconstruction? Can you just, if you know? Yeah, um, I've heard a few different things, but I'm not sure for sure. So I don't want to say something that's wrong. I've heard a few <laughs> different origin stories. Okay. Um, next question. Um, we, we're, we're going back to the septic. I see three units per acre permitted on septics. Um, again, the question, isn't that a problem with septic, high water table, drainage, et cetera? Realize that, so the, the three units per acre and the four units per acre, they were only recommended for those, the communities in the urban and suburban area, where for the most part, public water and public sewer are accessible. Now, there are some cases where they're not, and again, that's just a maximum density. You know, there's no guarantees that you're going to get that based on, you know, high water tables, septic issues, if you have to be on septic, grand trees, wetlands, marsh areas, and other factors. Um, it's just a maximum calculation of the number of units you can get based on the lot size that you have. Thank you. This is an interesting question. Um, was Is there interest or need at all to create similar um, overlays and land use for historic districts or historic areas, I mean, that are not associated with settlement communities? Um, so in the county, we have a lot of um, unincorporated areas that are the settlement communities, but then we had one community in the West Ashley area, the DuPont Wapu area, and that was a mixture of city of Charleston and the county. And so that was an effort where we worked with that community to do a community plan and they didn't have as much that was recognized as historic, but I think that that's something that came out of the community plan mm -hmm. that we needed to do a historic resource survey of that area to find out what the historic resources were, but there was definitely just local community history there that um, the, the residents felt passionate about preserving. And so whenever we were planning with them, um, that came through in the community plan and the overlay. Thank you. Um, do you know if there are any regulations in South Carolina or Charleston County related to minimizing impacts to the to wetlands? And if so, is there consideration in the zoning and land use categories specifically for coastal communities? Okay, so we have two types of wetlands. We've got the OCRM critical line areas, which are the marsh areas, and then we've got freshwater wetlands, both. So we do require um, fairly large buffers and setbacks from the critical line um, for all development, including single family detached residential. Um, we don't have any buffers from the freshwater wetlands, um, but you know, the Army Corps has jurisdiction over those. Um, so we, you know, that all and helps us with our CRS rating, um, which is uh, done through our building services department um, between that and our lower densities in the, the rural area of the county. And of course we have, you know, the requirements for FEMA and we just went to a two foot freeboard um, a couple of summers ago and in, in our building code, which also helps out. Okay, thank you. Um, this question, we are struggling with a council who doesn't view preservation as an important piece of the overall puzzle. Did you experience any of this? And if so, how did you create buy-in from the elected level? That's a loaded question. Good luck. Um, for us, it was sort of a grassroots effort over the years. You know, if you look in our ordinance today, our historic preservation uh, regulations are only about, you know, a half a page. We don't have a historic preservation commission. We don't even have a design review board. Uh, our those just, you know, our the powers that be weren't really interested in that when we were going through the process of the comprehensive plan back in 1999 and then the 2001 um, ordinance. Um, you know, of course, the city of Charleston as a historic preservation board and the design review board both. Um, so it's only been recently with sort of this groundswell. Um, of organizations being formed, these nonprofits, the uh, African American Settlement Communities Organization, which represents most, if not all, of the settlement communities in the eastern part of the county, 
um, and the, the Heritage Development Corporation on James Island. Um, and for us, it's also a factor of the amount of development that's happening right now because the developers are the last land that's really left that hasn't already been subdivided in the urban and suburban areas located in these communities. And so we're seeing you know, developers going in and buying up properties and then coming in and asking for um, either planned developments or, or other avenues to get to much smaller lot sizes than are allowed in the communities. And our, our council members and our planning commission members are, are seeing this and they're hearing from the community. So it's all kind of become somewhat of a perfect storm to let us sort of get our foot in the door to get these new regulations in and, and do these planning projects. Great. Given the extremely rural and sometimes isolated nature of many of these communities, is there any difficulty regarding either enforcement of or respect for the comp plan or the zoning ordinance? Um, yes, I think so. I think that a lot of times we see in the county that people that live out on the far reaches of the county, they don't really even realize what zoning regulations apply to them. And so we have a very active code enforcement division of our department and we constantly are getting um, calls from neighbors and having to educate folks about what the requirements are. But, you know, we found that as long as you work with people and you educate them, then they're, they want to comply. It's just more of a, a lack of knowledge, knowing what applies to you if you live out in the rural parts of the county. Thank you. Um, are you tracking whether or not the plan has created any new economic development opportunities? We are not, but that is a good thing to do. Um, we can certainly track that through our site plan review process. Um, you know, that's, that's required for any non-single family residential development. So that is, that's a good idea. We should, we should do that. Yeah. Okay. Um, Next question. The Gullah Geechee Cultural Heritage Corridor, which is across four states, was established by Congress in 2006. Is it also part of the National Park Service's National Historic Site, if you know? Uh, yeah, I know that there's a relationship with uh, the National Park Service and the Department of Interior, but offhand, I'm not sure what exactly that relationship is. Okay, um, we have a lot, we, we're still getting a lot of questions coming in about the community engagement process and how it was so successful. Uh, can you talk a bit more about the, who the key stakeholders were and how you were able to gain such strong community support and engagement? Um, yeah, so in the Parker's Ferry Project, we work to distribute flyers to the local churches. Um, we found that getting the word out through the churches was really successful. We have um, extensive interested parties lists with the county. So if you want to know what's going on in your area, you can email or call us and we'll add you so that you get notices about um, meetings that are coming up or requests that are happening that's going to be on a planning commissioner board of zoning appeals agenda. Um, so we've built those lists and so that has come in handy whenever we go out into communities, we already have at least somewhere to start. We also, for both Parker Ferry and Soul Agree, had one good community contact or a small community group that helped facilitate the, the outreach for us. So for Parker Ferry, there's the Willtown Community Organization and um, some of those members really made sure that people knew about the meetings. They told us if we were planning a meeting on a night that had a conflict with a local church event or something. Um, and so I'll agree, one of the community leaders was on our planning commission, so that helped uh, because she was also a member of the Concerned Citizens of Soul Agree Community Organization. And so she made sure that we were constantly communicating with their board. We were meeting with the business owners in the community. So um, we did a lot of grassroots, I think, outreach and efforts to make sure that we were talking to the right people. We also we would post community meeting signs in the communities, um, advertising it about a week beforehand. Um, and with Parker's Ferry, we would actually schedule the next meeting while we were at the, the, the meeting <laughs> so that everybody knew what it was and we knew what all the conflicts were and we could get the date and time um, set up then. Great, thanks. Um, do you 
use any predictability modeling um, combined with land use maps to ID areas where there might be a likelihood of uh, archaeological or historical resources? Um, and if so, what a cost and um, was there a relationship to historic overlays or future land use maps? We don't have that. Um, the most advanced thing that we have is we took the survey cards from all of the surveys that had been done beginning in 1989, um, including the current survey, and we, um, we mapped them so we know where they are. Um, so really beyond that, we haven't done a whole lot. Of, you know, our plan developments, we require um, an archaeological survey to be done. Um, sometimes that's just going to the State Historic Preservation Office website and see if there's anything nearby. Um, sometimes they're full-blown studies. So as part of the 2016 update, we had given all the full-blown studies um, to the consultant, and they had incorporated them as part of, of the project to help them find these sites. Yeah, but we will need to... You know, if our if our historic preservation ordinance is adopted, you know, we're going to have to be able to map all of the National Register sites and then any that get um, added to our local list over time to be able to see where they, they fall um, and where properties that are requesting to be uh, developed fall um, nearby so that we know if and when they have to go through these, these processes that, that will become part of this ordinance. Cool, thanks. Um, next question. Does the South Carolina DOT road ownership create any special consideration for historic resource preservation, um, in particular along Highway 17? Not that we're aware of. Okay, interesting. Um, next question. What kind, if any, resistance did you face in crafting the review recommendation um, for review of development within 300 feet of historic resources? Well, that is currently in our ordinance. Um, it requires a special review if you want to subdivide a property within 300 feet. Um, so the, the ordinance that's being proposed requires that to go to the um, the Historic Preservation Commission and also includes development of um, you know, non single family residential parcels because you have to go through site plan review for a property within 300 feet. Um, and that, that was actually a recommendation that came out of our planning commission and it was included in the ordinance. Um, so we really haven't heard any pushback um, from the residents on that. And, and actually, the African American Settlements Committee. Or commission mm -hmm. during our meetings, they really wanted that to be included mm -hmm. because they feel like that's an additional layer of protection if they were to become a historic district. So um, we've had a lot of community support for those provisions. Great. Um, what are some of the features of the loosening of home occupations that you mentioned? Um, so with home occupations, you're limited to one non-resident employee in the county, and we have a list of sort of prohibited home occupations, like car repair, those types of things. And for Parker's Ferry in particular, they wanted to sort of be able to increase um, the number of non-resident employees up to five if you went through the special exception procedures and got approval from the Board of Zoning Appeals. So there was a you know, community meeting about it, public hearing. Um, and then also to allow, because there are a lot of sort of car um, auto repair type things going on in Parker's Ferry, so, and the community doesn't have a problem with that. They want to make sure it can be a legal home occupation, so they wanted to, to allow that as well. Um, okay, next question. Has the rate of heirs' property being lost uh, has it slowed down or anticipated to slow down with these new planning initiatives? We we aren't really tracking that, but we hope that these um, help families to retain their land because they have more flexibility. They're able to subdivide possibly um, or get it cleared so that they can subdivide in the future. But that's not something that we personally track at the county. 
Okay. Um, I think we. Oh, go ahead. Okay, a lot of cases, folks don't want. It's hard to find out which properties are heirs' properties, which properties aren't. Just the fear of just someone coming in and being able to sort of buy the property out from under the family. Okay. Um, I think, you know what, I think we're going to go ahead and stop here because we've been <laughs> drilling you for like 15 minutes. <laughs> so um, I think we'll go ahead and stop. Um, and um, thanks to both of you. This was really interesting. And I personally have like 15 questions, but they're not formulated yet in my brain. So I'll be emailing you. Um, if there were any questions that we did not get to, um, feel free to reach out um, to the two speakers and you can get those questions answered. Again, um, we are recording this webcast. It will be available on our YouTube channel. And we also have a PDF of it um, available shortly on our webcast webpage, ohioplanning.org slash planning webcast. So to the two Andreas, thank you for joining us again. And um, everyone have a great weekend. Great, thanks. Thank you.